So before we go any further in our exploration of arguments and logical structure, it's worth becoming acquainted with an important distinction between two types of arguments, uh, factual arguments and practical arguments. So let's get at this distinction by looking at some examples. Here's another very simple argument. Every time it rains, we order pizza for dinner. Tonight it is going to rain, so tonight we're going to order pizza. Okay, seems like a pretty straightforward argument. Pretty persuasive, I'd say. Okay, let's consider this one now. Pizza tastes good. Pizza is cheap, so let's order pizza tonight. Now, obviously these arguments are similar in some respects. Um, for one thing, they're both about ordering pizza. And they're also good arguments in some sense, since they provide reasons that seem to support the conclusion. So what differences can we see between them? Well, let's consider the two conclusions. Tonight we are going to order pizza, and let's order pizza tonight. How do these statements differ? Well, one major difference between them is that we can ask in the first case, is that statement true? Is it actually true that we're going to order pizza tonight? Whereas you can't really do that in the second case. Right? Is let's order pizza true or false? Let's order pizza is not really a statement that is true or false or could be evaluated for true, being true or false. So we'll call it non-truth evaluable. It's more like a call to action than a statement of fact. So we see that the first argument is trying to show that something is true, that we are going to order pizza tonight, whereas the second argument is trying to show that a certain decision or course of action should be made on the basis of the evidence. So we should order pizza tonight, or let's do it, as opposed to we are going to, and here are some reasons why you should believe that. So to put it in other terms, the first argument is concerned with matters of fact, whereas the second argument is concerned with a practical question, a matter of action. The first argument's conclusion is an answer to a question about what is the case, whereas the second argument is about what should be the case, what should we do. And these are very different kinds of questions, and the kinds of reasons that you might give for one or the other are not necessarily the same. Uh, we can make another observation about these sentences. In the first case, you can observe that if you believe A and B, then you simply have to believe Z. We've talked about this kind of uh, phenomenon in a previous video. But if you believe that every time it rains, we order pizza, and you believe it's going to rain, then you simply have to believe that we're going to order pizza, or you won't be rational. That's not really the case for the second argument. right? You could believe that pizza tastes good, and you could believe that pizza is cheap, but it wouldn't be totally irrational to not want to order pizza tonight. right? So in that sense, the conclusion of the second argument is not entailed by the premises, whereas the conclusion of the first argument um, is entailed by the premises. So these are important differences. So we'll call arguments that are meant to establish matters of fact, meant to establish that something is true, factual arguments, and we'll call arguments that are supposed to provide reasons for doing something or for making a certain decision, practical arguments. So let's look at one or two more examples just to give you a little practice with these concepts and you can try and apply them yourself. <clears throat> so take a look at this argument. Everyone at the party will have a good time. Carol will be disappointed if we don't attend the party. So we should go to the party. Okay, take a moment and maybe pause the video and think for yourself about whether this counts as a practical argument or a factual argument. Okay, so in this case we're dealing with a practical argument. And why is that? Well, the conclusion is not really stating that something is the case or is true. It's recommending a certain decision or a certain course of action. And furthermore, the reasons that are being given aren't totally conclusive reasons, right? They provide some support for the conclusion, but you wouldn't be totally out of your mind if you believed A and B and didn't believe C. So this matches the characteristics of practical argument that we previously identified. Okay, let's take a look at another example. It's going to rain on Saturday. Whenever it rains, the tennis court is closed. If the tennis court is closed, we can't play tennis, so we won't be able to play tennis on Saturday. All right, so take a moment and decide for yourself whether this is a practical or a factual argument. 
In this case, it turns out we're dealing with a factual argument. Even though this is also the subject matter of this argument is about what we sh what we're going to do, or you know, uh, a matter of action, the conclusion is itself a statement of fact, which can be evaluated for truth or falsity. Right? We won't be able to play tennis on Saturday. Either they're going to be able to play tennis, or they're not going to be able to play tennis. Uh, it's not a matter of decision. It's it's a matter of fact. Right? And similarly, if we look at the relation between the premises and the conclusion, um, we can see that in this case, A, B, and C do entail D, right? If A, B, and C are true, then you just have to accept D as true as well. So this is a good example of a factual argument. So we've introduced this distinction between factual arguments and practical arguments, and it's good to keep this in mind, uh, although primarily in this course we'll be dealing with factual arguments.